Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Text in the City. My name is Ruby J. Murray and I'm here to take you through this series. If you haven't been here before, uh, it's a great series that we run here at the Wheeler Centre which chooses a text from the VC English list each week and pulls it apart, blows air on its moving parts and puts it back together for you again with an expert. And today I'm very delighted to have a serious expert in many ways with us. Kavita Dara is the editor at Readings Books, Music and Film and a publisher at Brass Monkey Books, an imprint of Hunter Publishing which um, showcases writing from across the Indian subcontinent for Australians especially. It launched last year with Anjan Hassan's Big Girl Now and Lunatic in My Head. And it's especially interesting to have Kabita here with me to do this one because she has a personal connection to this text in some ways too. In that, like Jhumpa Lahiri, she has a parent from Bengal and grew up across the world really, from London and then 15 years or around in Singapore and then in Australia afterwards. So a personal and a professional engagement with the text. Uh, before we start, I'm going to ask how many of you in the audience have actually read the book so far. Can you put up your hands? Amazing. So we know where we're at then. Um, this is an interesting book for us to be doing at Text in the City as it's the first collection of short stories that we've done this year. And I wanted to start off by asking you, Kabita, what you think makes a good short story and why this collection in particular, what's so special about it. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000, which is unusual, I think, for a collection of short stories. It just was a massive success. What do you, what, why the short story and why Jhumpa Lahiri in particular? Um, I think the big difference, um, and I'll, I'll talk about Jhumpa Lahiri because she's also written a novel um, called Namesake, which was made into a movie, um, and then another collection of short stories after that called Unaccustomed Earth. And I think the big difference, and I, I have to admit I prefer her short stories to her novel, um, I think the big difference is in the way you use detail and set scenes. Um, you have to, I think in novels you have to be very careful that to give enough detail, but not so much that you get bogged down in detail. That's not important, and it's not just there as filler. So it's the scene set in a very different way, where short stories you have to be a lot more concise, and almost there's almost more being said in the gaps and the silences and the things that you don't know than um, than having it all sort of set out for you. Um, and I think Jim Valeri does does that amazingly well. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of cultural stuff in there as well, and she doesn't sort of ram it down your throat and, be, and she isn't really obvious about everything but she doesn't leave a gap that, where you don't understand what's going on either. Yeah, there's a real sense, I think, Orson Scott Card, who's a weird person to actually quote in context to, to this book, but he's, when he talks about short stories, he talks about short stories always leading to, like, in a momentum towards one point, mm. whereas novels are a collection of those smaller mm. climaxes yeah. as a, like, a larger experience, mm. which is sort of different to these ones. I mean, Jhumpa Lahiri doesn't always have a point in her short stories, though. Do you feel like you're getting a, a certain climax point from each one as a moral point? Yeah, or? and, and there are sort of mi more microcosms of worlds yeah. between just two people and, you know, one little thing that happens between them and it's it's a lot harder to carry that off in a novel and make it yeah. interesting. <laughs> Her second collection of short stories was so huge it came in, it's one of the first only ever collections to come in at a, at a bestseller on the New York Times booksellers list as well. Mm -hmm. So obviously she's got something that she's doing really right as far as cl critical mm -hmm. acclaim here goes. Um, and we were talking before at the back about maybe what sh the idea of a short story cycle in that there's they're not actually they're, stories that stand apart in her work. They're very much stories that sort of sit together. Mm -hmm. What do you think is sort of drawing them together? Would you agree that they're a short story cycle rather than um, In some ways, yeah, they are a cycle. Um, obviously, there are some that are very different, like the um, Bibi Halder story or um, the story of Burima. It's, it, they're quite different from the ones set in the US. But um, I think thematically they, they work um, as a cycle, and I think a good short story collection should in some ways be a cycle anyway, um, to hold it together, otherwise they're just random bits of just stories. Um, whereas I think that so much of this is about, I think loneliness is one of the biggest things that she talks about, and all the characters are, are experiencing that in different ways, in different settings, um, you know, they're of different genders, different socioeconomic groups, and um, but they're all experiencing the same thing, and in that sense, I think they are all linked. Yeah. We are going to ask you to open up for your questions at the end as well. So as we're talking, do keep in mind any questions that you might want to ask Kabita or that you might wish that you'd asked Kabita in November this year as well. <laughs> Since, uh, 
I think the idea of the cycle too, that there are thematic linking themes. You mentioned loneliness there. Themes, especially for the majority of our audience, are super important in relation to this book. What other themes do you find pulling this collection together? Um, I thought, well, to me, I think the biggest thing was, it was I think it all centered in a way around loneliness and then sort of taking off. And I think grief was a big part of it and how different people deal with grief um, and ritual. I think uh, different mm -hmm. kinds of ritual and, and using ritual to deal with grief or loneliness. I think that that was a really a big one as well. One yeah. of the huge rituals that I noticed all the way through this text is the use of food. It's amazing. They eat constantly all the way through every <laughs> single short story from it beginning to end. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, and the other one, obviously, to the idea of Bengali heritage in in America. And um, I wanted to ask you, what parts of her writing do you find American, and what parts do you find Indian? And are we even allowed to say that about writers mm -hmm. and apportion parts of their identity like that? Yeah, I think with some writers you can do that. Um, I think Junpa Lahiri is one where I, I was thinking about this yesterday, and I thought, I, I don't think I can actually pick out something completely that would be uniquely Indian about it. And, you know, I mean, I think f from what Not I remember... the food? Oh, the food, <laughs> I suppose. But, you know, there are writers from other cultures who do a lot yeah. of food. I, I, think, I think migrant writing often has a lot of food in it because um, the, I think food is such a big part of remembering home and bringing people together and mm. you know it's mrs sen for example all that not just eating but actually preparing the food where she's cutting all those vegetables and she's thinking about all the women sitting together and cutting yeah. vegetables and that that just to get that feeling um you know so i think you could probably say that she has that sort of diasporic migrant yeah. writer trait rather than an indian trait in that and um, I think she grew up in the US, so I think her, her, yeah. the way she's written, it's, it's, I think, very much an American writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, did, she grew up in, like, yeah, I think Rhode Island is the area that she was from. She's come under, because she's still American and writing about India, she's come under a lot of criticism in India for daring to write, a, 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 and in some ways justify criticism too, when you look at the two short stories in this collection, which are based solely in India with Indian characters and no American characters. It's a very, um, it's a fairly grim picture of India and they're both women who are servants within, of a certain sort within larger households. Mm. Um, do, and Indians were very angry saying, well, you've, you're an Indian and you've painted India badly. Mm. Do you agree that she's painted India badly with this? I think she's sh um, shone a light on a part of it that Indians don't want people necessarily talking about a lot and that's not always because of you know that's not always a bad reason behind it sometimes it is because you know Indians get sick of their country being thought of mm. as just this poor place and and you know the whole western world looking at them as this poor place and all the women are oppressed and all you know and and that narrative that goes on and um, it does happen I'm not saying it doesn't happen but there is also this other side to it and I think they're very sensitive about people just going on about that and um, I mean uh, it's just a little bit off on a tangent but you know I was um, when I was studying overseas I was studying in the UK for a while and I and we had a whole group of people from all over Europe sitting there and some friends of mine had sent me a care package um, from Australia and they sent me two DVDs the castle and loaded and so all these people were watching these two DVDs and that was they didn't know anything about Australia and that's what their idea was the castle mm -hmm. and loaded, you know, and it's in some ways, I guess that's what, you know, um, people get. The people thing. get, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially, I mean, India is amazing as a place as well. When you think, and this is why I feel like uh, there's a great degree of validity to that. Not that you can always capture everything in every story, mm -hmm. but there's a population within India that at the same size as Germany, which has the same degree, like degree of living lifestyle yeah. economic situation so it's a hugely diverse yeah and I think um, in, of course Indians think that there are other things that should be talked about more mm. you know um, for example there's um, a bit of this parts of India where there's a civil war going on that people outside India know nothing about and the question is well why isn't why isn't literature about that getting out yeah. why is it always about the women and the poverty and yeah. you know spice markets and <laughs> it's very hard to do with a short story collection, unfortunately, isn't it? Right, about everything. That, yeah, yeah, that's right. I guess in that way, what do you think you have a responsibility as a writer and has Jhumpa Lahiri pulled it off? What, who is her responsibility to with this collection and has she managed to fulfil that? Mm. I, think, I think the only thing she can do is write 
what she knows. And I mean, I think the reason she does so well from in this is because she is writing about what she knows. She's writing about um, Bengali migrants, her family, living in the US where she lives. Um, and the two stories that are set in India are both set in Calcutta where her family would, you know, Bengal where her family would be from. So I think, um, and not that I think that people who aren't from there can't write from there, but I think um, the scrutiny on her because of her background, um, I, I don't think that holds up. I think she's not, you know, she's writing about her, she, I think she's writing about her own experiences basically, and so I don't think anyone can criticize, yeah. you know, her for trying to speak for anyone else or anything yeah. like that. There's this idea of representation too, and I think that especially when represent, like, like you're saying about India feeling that it's misrepresented in the national literatures of other areas, mm -hmm. um, if it's underrepresented, sorry, like there's not enough stories, then if you are writing about the area, then maybe that's part of it. They feel like mm -hmm. that's the only representation and therefore it should be able to do lots. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Which maybe she does with a short story cycle too, and that mm -hmm. she's got so many different people coming into it mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. The other thing that she does too is write sort of in a very narrow class range. Mm -hmm. Her, they're all very thematically, they're, academics, middle class academics yeah. and with a few other ones. What do you think her, do you think that says anything about her attitude to class or is it just, a, does she have anything to say about that? I, don't know. I think partly, it would, again, I think it's because of probably what she grew up in, but also I think around the time that she was um, going, you know, her family would have gone to the US, um, and I'm saying this because I think I'm around the same age as her and I, I know this from when we lived overseas and in, in the UK and, and in Australia, the kind of people from India who were going out at that time were predominantly yeah. academics, doctors, lawyers. I mean, they weren't, you know, not, not a lot of people were going just to do an undergraduate degree or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was always at a, at a higher stage of education and, um, and research. Or what. So I think yeah. partly it's her experience, partly it was actually what she was, you know, it's realistic what yeah. was going on then, yeah. yeah. There's a few, the, there's two, there's two short stories that use um, uh, Anglo-Celtic descent characters as their narrators. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the one story which is sexy where she falls in love with an Indian man. There's a, a white woman who falls in love with an Indian man. Mm -hmm. And there's also the Mrs. Sen story where the child is talking mm -hmm. out. Do you feel that those stories in any way are different to the other ones? Do they, does that set them apart in any way or...? Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it's, it was really interesting to put those stories in, just to give that other side of it. I think um, they didn't stand out in so far as I thought they were still very well written, and I think they were still very, they felt very true to, um, to you know, what was going on. Um, although I think she wrote the, the one about the little kid, I think was a bit better done, I think, yeah. I thought, than Miranda. But um, um, no, I, I think, I think if you're a good writer, you can, mm. you can do that and, and get away with it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saying that now, I realise too that we've mentioned two, two set in India with, and, and then the two um, white characters as well. And then there's also the two ones that bookend the book about marriage. marriage yeah. What do you think she's doing with those sort of attempts to have so many different themes in the same Mm. In different, well, different, the same themes in different stories, I should say. I'm getting myself backwards there. Mm. Um, well, I guess there would have, um, I don't know what sort of store of other stories she had to choose from, but I, maybe they were also picked to make the collection so tight. Um, you don't feel, even though you know there are all these different characters, and stuff, you don't actually feel like you're straying too far into. Mm you know, nothing jars, it all sorts, it sort of fits in together. And I think, um, I think, yeah, they were probably deliberately chosen that way and, and deliberately written that way to have that symmetry. Yeah. Um, yeah. She says that she's very much, like, I think part of the interesting thing for me was I was really looking for messages and I often try to do that when I'm reading a book. I like want to work out what the authors think and what they're telling me about the world and how the world should be too in the, every sort of description is a prescription in a way. Mm. Um, and I find that really hard with Jhumpa Lahiri. I just don't know what she's talking about most of the time or what she wants me to feel about things. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you know what she feels, like how she's feeling and how she thinks the world should be? Yeah, well th this is, it's an interesting, it's a hard one because obviously I, I identify with her. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I know, um, <laughs> but um, I think that the reason she probably doesn't 
make it so clear is I think all she's really trying to do is give you a peek into these lives that you know aren't mm. necessarily open to everyone to look at and um, you know the very, like Mrs. Sen for example in her life how many people would know that she has this life where she's missing her family so much and she's you know her rituals of the way she repairs food and um, the way the house is arranged and her fears about how about driving like you know, if you don't actually know an Indian family or you don't know yeah. my, you, you don't and so I think all she's trying to do is actually give you a really well, often usually sympathetic look into yeah. these lives. Yeah. The New York Times, when they were writing about this collection, said that um, it was. I thought I had the the quote here, but um, oh, here we go. No, it was Time Magazine. I'm wrong. Among the things you will not find in Jhumpa Lahiri's fiction are humour, suspense, cleverness, profound observations about life, vocabulary above tenth grade level, footnotes, and typographical experiments. Um, and that was actually a positive review. They thought that she was amazing. <laughs> so they weren't, they weren't slamming her at all. Um, do you find that true of her fiction? Do you find that she's like overly simplistic almost? Or because I actually didn't think that when I was writing no. it, I was like, Ooh, beautiful, lush. I, th I thought but, that of her novel, yeah. but I don't think her short stories are like that. Yeah. Maybe she just likes short stories more. Like, yeah. Maybe she likes writing them more. And I don't know. I, I thought the novel was was simplistic, and that's yeah. why I, I preferred the short stories. But yeah. yeah, she's said about writing that she approaches writing stories as a recorder, and I think that she. Uh, she thinks that her, her role is some kind of reporting, reporting device, recording and projecting, mm. like in, this, in that way, which is similar to what you were just saying yeah. about how you found that she, yeah, she records the life stories of immigrants mm. rather than mm. finding meaning in them. Yeah. yeah. The other thing about when I was that Time magazine article too, though, and what I took from her writing was I felt that, and I don't know if that's just my assumptions about Indian writing playing into that, um, but I actually did find that her prose was quite rich mm -hmm. um, in a way that I associated with a heritage of Indian literature as being different to, um, yeah, that a much more sparse um, English tradition in some mm -hmm. ways. But you don't think so, or um, am I misshooting completely? She probably, she's probably not a writer who'd come to mind straight away if yeah. you were to talk about language that way. But I guess, yes, there are elements of it. Mm. But I, yeah, I, she wouldn't be the first writer, Indian writer, I think, <laughs> of if you were talking about lush prose or, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think is interesting about her writing too is there's a lack of a hook. There's no tricks. Like she doesn't have precocious narrators. There's no magic. There's mm. no um, really like. Maybe there's no lush prose after all. Maybe I'm completely <laughs> restating this. What do you think is the draw card for her in America? Why, like, why Jhumpa Lahiri in particular over so many other subcontinental writers? Um, well, I think, first of all, I think the writing is very good. I think she does convey what she wants, you know, which I think others... I, well, you know, maybe it is because people don't want to be preached to and all mm. she's doing is giving you this look into these lives. And I, I would think that... Um, Especially, I mean, she's writing a lot about Boston, you know, Harvard and around that area. And I could imagine a whole lot of people growing up seeing Indians around and not knowing anything about what actually goes on, yeah. you know. Um, often uh, there'd be the assumption that they must be just so happy to be in the US and away from in India. Yeah. And no one's thinking about, you know, the, the loneliness or the grief or, or how it must really be. And I think, um, I think in America it's probably... I think people are interested in that. It's stories about, it's basically stories about people around them, yeah. so, yeah. Which has been sort of traditional of American fiction too. I mean, that there is a great interest in like the normal life in America. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe we're seeing that shift too in a new generation of writers who are coming through, like Juno Diaz, mm. who writes about the Dominican Republic, yeah. I think, and a whole lot of writers that are now like not old school Jonathan Franzen type white male um, writers. Do you think we see that in Australia as well at all? Are we going to come for a shift through a shift here or? Maybe. Um, yeah. I, I don't think it's happening as much here, but yeah. um, I think, you know, there is always the potential for it to happen. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one to, 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 to predict, but I think it could happen. <laughs> if Hunter Press, if you'll go out and buy Hunter Press's books afterwards. Yeah. There's, um, the, the, what was I going to say about the, the way that it's shifted to her, her narratives, I find it very much about sort of complexity. Um, and this is going to be something that you probably won't get to write about in your um, English exams. But we were talking before about um, Out the Back 
about the Australian, what the Australian novel is in sort of popular culture as well, and mm -hmm. that maybe there's a India accuses um, Jhumpa Lahiri of being too negative and not painting India in a good enough light. Whereas mm -hmm. in Australia, all we want to do is be negative. All we want to do is buy books about people from the suburbs who um, have incredibly, incredibly miserable lives, which aren't necessarily representative of <laughs> the major population. Um, what do you think's going on there? <laughs> Why do we want to hate Australia and India wants to love <laughs> India? I think it's it's about where the country or the culture is in in a cycle. I mm -hmm. think um, I think for India, it's um, they've had years of either the kind of writing that was from the Raj, where it was, you know, about um, British soldiers and the glory of the British Raj, and and um, you know, a very sort of Orientalist. Um, gaze on what the what the Indians were like, um, and the characters often didn't have a voice or any depth. They were just the servants, or just you know, it was no one was actually looking behind those characters at all. Um, and then there was the shift into writing about um, the exotic, you know. So all the books were coming out with spice markets and marigolds and. Um, the smells and the, mm. you know, um, paisley covers and all of that. There was all a lot of that, and um, and I think India's at a stage now where they, you know, they, it's it's a more confident nat nation in the um, in the context of what modern nations are. You know, the economy is doing well. A, a lot of um, people are, have been educated overseas and are choosing to go back to live in India because. You know, you can get everything there now. Yeah. And you don't need to. And I mean, I think it opened in the 80s um, when Rajiv Gandhi came in as prime minister. It opened up trade and and all of that. Oh, sorry, not Rajiv Gandhi. It was Manmohan Singh opened it up to trade and um, and all of that. So, um, I think it's it's they're in that cycle now of not wanting to be looked at in that way. Um, I think. I think it's fair enough, but I also think that you can't go too far the other way and ignore that there are still problems. Yeah. I mean, the, if anyone's been there, I mean, the gap between the rich and poor is just, you know, in your face all the time. So you can't go one way or the other. Um, and I think um, with Australian writing, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that um, maybe part of it is um, trying to work out what that distinctive thing is because for a long time you know the, the image was that it had to be about the outback or be about mm -hmm. you know to be Australian it had to be about one of the world wars or about the Anzacs or about the outback and I think maybe the shift has gone another way and maybe it's gone a little bit too much the yeah. other way I don't know. <laughs> for our nervous pen clutches in the audience you mentioned Orientalism there quickly would you just give a vague idea of what Orientalism is and whether or not you think Jhumpa Lahiri is at all Orientalist in this? Um, Orientalism, the very basic thing is, um, is basically the gaze of um, the West on the East, um, and it's hard to say. In, <laughs> I'm trying to summarise it. Um, it's 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 a way of sort of I suppose looking at at, at the East as um, in a particular way with you know with with the exoticism with the um, that people are of a lesser intellect or, or you know, aren't capable of ruling themselves and, and things like that. Um, the, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know how to is she, it. <laughs> is she, is she, or in what ways, I think is probably a better question, in what ways is she Orientalist or is she completely? Yeah, I, I don't think she is. Yeah. I, yeah, no, I don't think she is at all. And I think the two stories where they're set in India, I mean, the great thing about it is that she's actually writing about women who probably wouldn't get written about yeah. usually, you know. And I think that's the big thing that you know, even if Indians want to criticise, the fact is there wouldn't be that many Indian writers writing about a, a, a pretty much a homeless woman who's mm -hmm. sweeping a building, and or a woman who's been ostracised by her her family. They just usually wouldn't get a voice. So yeah. you know. If she's doing it, yeah. great. <laughs> she uses a very interesting narrative technique through it too, where she talks in third person um, plural using we, which is a very difficult one to use, but I think she pulls it off quite effectively. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I think maybe that is an Indian thing. Is it? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't saying it's yeah. an Indian thing. I see no, it. no, but maybe that's why I didn't realise it, because yeah. I think my family and stuff probably talk in we a lot more, yeah. because it's always about 
multiple <laughs> the multitudes behind yeah <laughs> yeah our um, our microphones are starting to walk down the side so i'm going to ask one more question on your behalf before we open up to your questions <laughs> um, and i wanted to ask about the process of writing about books too and maybe about writing about short stories um in what way would you sit down to write about a short story differently to how you'd sit down to write about a novel and to what degree do you sort of bring your own reaction to the book into that writing as well mm. um, I don't think I think the main thing is that when you sit down and work out what you want to write about um, I think you don't try to force it the other way I think there's a there's a lot of um, um, you know, there's a lot of push sometimes to think that the, to be a writer you have to have a novel. Um, whereas I think if you, I think I actually think short stories are a lot harder um, because there are so many things you have to leave out, and you have to choose just the right things to leave out and just the right things to leave in. Whereas, you know, and I'm not saying this all novels. Obviously, it doesn't happen in good novels, but. Um, you can leave in extraneous bits and pieces and you know sometimes if it's particularly badly done you can have a whole um, side narrative going that has got nothing to do with Harry anything. Potter book seven. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that I think it's it's about being honest about your story and and trying and recognizing um, when it's not not trying to push it into a form that it's it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone out there with a question? Yeah, oh, there's one up the front. Um, I was just wondering, why do you think the author picks the interpretive melodies as being the title? Does it have any significance? Hmm. I think it's one of the better titles in the book. Um, but also, I think because maybe she does see her role a little bit as being an interpreter between cultures um, and that sort of has the resonance of it. I mean, the character in that, the interpreter, that's what is sort of confuses him that he goes from, you know, translating languages to translating someone's melody. And um, I think maybe that's maybe that is the link um, to the rest of the book. Yeah, yeah. It's, there's a beautiful line in that story too, where um, in that idea of interpretation too, and that that's what her job is and what his job is. Um, he. She's just the woman in the ca in the story has just revealed that she's had the affair and she's talking about her pain and the um, Mr. Kabasai or Kabas mm. I can't remember the taxi driver's names says to her is it pain that you're feeling or guilt mm. and it's a beautiful idea too about migration too maybe yeah. in general that you must there must be a lot of guilt in escaping or getting to shift stations too mm. and then pain as well about yeah mm. it's a it's a lovely story that one. Mm. Is there more out there? Kabita had a question for you guys, I think, too, but there's a question up the front here. We just maybe just wait for the microphone so that we can hear you at the back. Sorry. I just thought what you were saying about Orientalism was very interesting because often with Orientalism, the Asians that are being Orientalized by the Westerners adopt those customs and become like the, the definition. And I think in the story of Sexy, there's a really interesting. Um, play with it in the sense that Dev is sort of reversing it and he's choosing this and, and I'm not sure of this that's why I'm asking you he's choosing this American woman because she's got these long legs and she offers this little bit of exotica or he's choosing her because if he chooses an Indian woman it'll get back to the Indian community and his wife will find out but she also Miranda is also um, attracted to the exotica of him and she tries to become like an oriental woman mm. become this um, image that that he's depicted of her but only she does that because i'm sure he doesn't see her like that at all mm. she's just someone yeah. to sleep with yeah yeah no, that, that's that's true and i think you're right i mean i think there is there is both of that in that that um that um she you know that both of them end up playing roles and i think you're definitely right about dev um 
you know, he, he, it's the it's the unknown that's exotic. That's always the key. It's whether it's um, a Westerner looking at it, he's, uh, either way around. It's always the unknown which is which is sexy. And the little kid says something like that. I think I can't remember the exact quote, but he says something about basically it's the unknown. Not knowing someone mm. is is sexy. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> and within that idea too, the idea of balance again is like an enduring theme in those books that they're looking at each other, and that you get the idea of that two play always between mm. her ambiguity her annoying ambiguity <laughs> that you just can't solve. Were there any other hands up there? Could I just ask a question? Um, can you just put up your hands if you found the cultural aspects of the book difficult to understand or you found them overwhelming or, or daunting, the book itself? Anyone did? No? Good. What an intelligent <laughs> audience. Yeah, they're either great. all intelligent or they're all liars. <laughs> I'm not sure. I found elements of the cultural stuff difficult. Is that sure? You sure nobody found that any of the cultural <laughs> stuff chance. different? Uh, maybe everybody's been to India and I haven't. But um, I found elements of the cultural things difficult. I guess also just being hyper aware all the time of whether or not, because of her position in culture too, whether or not she is sort of, yeah, I mean, oh, there's the end of the story, um, the treatment of, oh, I'm forgetting the last line now. <laughs> Yell out if, if you know it, and I'm, ah, thank you, the treatment of who we have. A, the last um, line of that, um, which is from the community's point of view, is for years afterwards we wondered who in ta our town had disgraced her, and for those who haven't read the book, she was raped. Um, but there was no point in carrying out an investigation. She was, to the best of our knowledge, cured. Um, it's a pretty, that's a pretty interesting and ambiguous way to end mm -hmm. a short story that's just ended in a potential rape of, mm -hmm. of somebody who has, uh, for all intents, is a disability. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it's mental or not is never really explored. Mm -hmm. But I found that difficult to sort of engage with. I wasn't sure if that's representative of Indian attitudes or mm -hmm. to the degree to which we're meant to think it is mm -hmm. or... I think, I think it's two things. I think part of it is um, the thing about not speaking up because of shame and all of that. But I mean, everyone knew that mm -hmm. she'd be raped. I think the second thing is it, it's a socioeconomic thing. I think if it had been the lady of a big house with a lot of money, there probably would have been a police investigation yeah. or something. But she was you know, considered a nobody, her family, had, who was going to bother chasing it up, really. Yeah. You know? So maybe partly cultural, but partly, I think, socioeconomic, yeah. yeah. Think now, all those clicking pens out there. Go on, think rapidly. What are you gonna What are you gonna wish that you'd asked in November? <laughs> are you sure she was raped? Um, there's a question from the front here. We do have to wait for uh, for microphones, but it, it's it's. Are you sure she was raped? I don't know. I look. That was what I took away from it. So if if other people have taken mm -hmm. other things away from it, maybe she wasn't. I'm not. Yeah. Maybe. Are you yeah. asking because it seemed like she wanted yeah. to be with someone and. Or she yeah. needed to be cured, yeah. and the cure that is prescribed mm. is, yeah, mm. potentially not people are... It's that ambiguity. <laughs> ambiguity, <laughs> ambiguity. What, what stood out for you the most? What, what is the message you'll take from this collection, if there is a message? What's the most striking element for you? Um, if you were going to sit down and write a Year 12 exam, what would you write about? <laughs> Um, look, I read this book when it came out in 1999 or 2000 when it first came out and um, I haven't really gone back to it. I loved it, absolutely loved it, but hadn't gone back to it. And when I got asked to do this, the first image that came to my mind from the book was that image from the first story where the husband and wife are sitting there with candlelight. And I'd actually forgotten a lot of the story, but that image just, you know, where they're sitting there and they start off not knowing what to say and then it becomes this game of telling each other. That just came to me straight away. So I think for me, and maybe this is why I keep talking about the loneliness aspect of it, the way she encapsulates those moments of being face to face with someone who you know, you're married to or you think you're close to or you want to be close to and, or you think you're alike, um, or you think you've had some understanding of their life previously, and how wrong you can be, how you can sit there and suddenly realise it's, you know, mm. it's, you just don't know. <laughs> Reversals. Were there any questions? So I'm going to keep on bombarding. With my, there's one up the back, so we might just go that way first. Um, what did you think about the story, This Blessed House? What did I think of it? Um, 
um, it, was a, it was a little bit different from the other ones. Um, but again, I think it did come back to the same thing because the, you know, it made the husband sort of look at his wife. You know, when they, it was just the two of them, he was looking at her as, you, you almost as a reader find this sort of moment when the party guests are there and all of that, where your view of her completely changes. Um, throughout the, the first part of the story, you do sort of get, she's almost portrayed as a bit silly and a mm -hmm. bit sort of, you know, ditzy or something. And um, in the second part, when the guests are there and you're looking at her th through the guests' eyes, you get a completely different, you know, she's actually a very confident woman who just likes to, you know, she's fun, that's all. And, and maybe it's the, the, the narrator is the one who's unreliable. Maybe he doesn't know how to have fun, you know. So I, I thought um, it was a little bit different from the other stories, but I thought there was still that element of um, really not knowing the person that you live with or the person that you're supposed to be close to. And maybe sometimes what it takes to be able to see them is to see them through a stranger's eyes. Mm. Its role within the collection is interesting too because the female character in that one is the only super sort of vivacious, very yeah. empowered, mm. happy female sort of role really mm. within the book. Yeah. So if you're looking at the story individually, uh, there's that. And if you're looking at the story as part of a larger collection too, and when you were talking about how stories are selected to fit within that, mm. in the idea of a cycle or a very coherent collection, there was a real need, I think, yeah. for her character. Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah for a little bit of brightness and a little bit of happiness. Mm -hmm. Was there another question up the back there that I saw a hand with before? No. There's, a, there's an idea too that um, when Jhumpa Lahiri has written about this idea of bicultural um, narratives as well, which is one of the things we haven't really touched on so much, interestingly, even though it's one of, or maybe because it's one of the most dominant themes in the book, um, she said in an interview that as a child I sought perfection and so denied myself the claim to any identity. As an adult, I accept that a bicultural upbringing is a rich but imperfect thing. Mm. And I just wondered if you could sort of comment to that too, because there seems to be so much like um, imperfection in single cultural upbringings too. Do you think that there's, yeah, I don't know, mm -hmm. it's all cultural? backgrounds imperfect in some way and are we maybe assuming a sort of a sameness of culture within single cultures that we shouldn't because mm -hmm. you've lived in a few different cultures now yeah um, I think um, I think it was always the ideal I think the reason why it was hard when you know if you were a migrant child and you were in a new you new country and especially at a time when there weren't a lot of people from your country in that country I think I think the problem was that people did assume that you only had to have you, to be authentic or to f feel settled, you only had to have one culture because mm -hmm. then you could just belong to that. Um, and I think that's actually, if you look at the in at Indian writing, I think you can see that in um, in in the writers. I mean, Salman Rushdie, who's possibly my favorite writer, the fact is that he did leave India and he stayed out of India and he wrote from that position. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there is a new breed of writer at the moment where a lot of them have gone overseas and studied, but they've chosen to go back. And so um, they've, they've encountered that bicultural life and yeah. instead of wrestling with it and choosing one, they've decided to make that, you know, um, yeah. make, to, to mine that for the richness that's there. Um, I don't think one or the other is, is more rich than the yeah. other, but it's, I think the attitudes to them have definitely changed. Yeah. I think, um, you know, a lot of uh, migrant kids, like when I was, um, when I first moved out of India, a lot of um, other Bengali kids or Maharashtrian kids, they didn't speak their language at home because the parents were trying to make them learn English. So they all grew up without speaking their own language at home. And there was, you know, it was to that extent. And now you find that less and less There's people my age who are having their kids who, mm. who what, who are trying to get them to learn the language from home, otherwise it'll be lost, you know. Yeah. So I think the attitudes changed. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly too, Jhumpa Lahiri has married a Mexican, Guatemalan, um, <laughs> Greek, American as well. So the children are learning like four yeah, languages. Hopefully, in, hopefully in, they're going to be writers. Yeah. <laughs> Any last questions there? There's one up the front here. Just yeah, in there. <laughs> just pass it along. What do you think of Lahiri's portrayal of arranged marriages? Do you think it's accurate? Because she does talk about it. Um, I, think, I think arranged marriages are... 
it's, that's, yeah. Go on, um, give the last <laughs> word on the red marriages. I think um, there are good ones and there are bad ones, just like there are good and bad non-arranged marriages. Um, um, in the, the way I think arranged marriages are done has, has also changed a lot in India. That it used to be that you know you wouldn't see your the person you're going to marry on the day till you actually met them, um, like you met them on the dais and you know when you're getting married. Um, and these days it's more um, a lot of the time now it's actually an introduction. You get introduced to someone and you decide if you want to get married. But um, I think yeah, like I, I think there are some re really bad ones and it's it's probably accurate and then there are some that you know um, work and that's accurate too so yeah. <laughs> interestingly I think the final story in the collection which is about an strange measure is is the only autobiographical one in that she mm. said quite outrightly that it's written about um, her father and his trip oh, to, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But this is what we were saying too before about the idea of whether or not um, whether or not it's Trumpa Lahiri who's actually saying things about arranged marriages or if it's something that we she asks us to think about it's, and it's very difficult and unclear mm -hmm. although that one especially because the book and, and the idea that everything in the book is always balanced in another way by something else in a very mm -hmm. very cleverly constructed manner mm -hmm. that she opens the book with the story of a non-arranged marriage that's fallen apart and is sort of very cold and mm -hmm. a lack of communication and then closes it with an arranged marriage that's, that that's functional so, yeah. and, and yeah. happy yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if there's anything else. I think we're nearly completely out of time here anyway, so it's a, a good note to end on. Um, balance again, always balance in Jhumpa Lahiri. I'd like to remind you that we're here for Cozzy at the same time next week and get you to join me in thanking Kabita Dara from Grass Monkey Books. Thank you, Kabita. Thank you.